again, since this is being taped, we've got to make a little bit more. But my name is Wright Quinn. I'm the Forest Park Environmental Manager. And I'd like to welcome you to Forest Park, to our Senior Center, and to our presentation. Now, this is the sixth, sixth presentation that That's Carol right. has done for us in our series. And, and all of our videos have been taped, or presentations have been taped. They're on my website, so if you haven't seen them, please go to the Forest Park Environmental webpage, scroll down, and it's there. Okay? And I've got sheets over there on the table that give you instructions on how to get there, too, if you need that. Right now, I know I, I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm so glad that y'all can make it. But for those who do not know Carol, I'd like to just read a little bio because she's quite an amazing person. Uh, as a naturalist, speaker, and writer, Carol has taught at the University of Cincinnati and the Hamilton County Park District, leading classes on urban wildlife issues, native plants, weed identification. I need you over my <laughs> Everybody needs that. <laughs> and the historical use of plants. One of her favorite uh, botanical projects was the design of a medis medicinal garden. Medicinal, thank you, medicinal <laughs> garden. I've been practicing that word all day. And it just <laughs> displays that the Ohio Governor's Regency Heritage Gardener and the Lord Medicinal The Lloyd Medicinal Garden of right, with the Lloyd Library here in Cincinnati. Right which fits in exactly what we're going to be doing today. Carol is a recipient of the Citation for Horticulture Education from the Garden Club of Ohio. She continues to offer lectures and workshops in her retirement, teaching informally to many groups from master gardeners to wildlife rehabilitators. She is busy, very busy. So we're very lucky to have her at, for our uh, presenter on this series. She is the longtime host of the weekly radio show, Outdoor Life, on WNKV Radio here in Cincinnati, and I was on there once or twice, it was a great, great time. The show features unique topics and interviews tying together nature, science, art, and culture. So we are very fortunate to have her. She's going to do one more uh, presentation for us on October 29th. That's going to be Ohio Native Plants. No, 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 that's what we're doing here. <laughs> Nature did it first. first. That's right. Nature did it first. And that's going to be October 29th. Here. Right here in the same building. And I'll be seeing it out email so everybody will know. That one's about the ideas that nature had that we borrowed. So things like Velcro and zippers and even the new stop wound uh, foam that emergency trauma people are using all came from nature. So we borrow a lot from nature. I will go ahead October 29th. So I want to turn it over to Carol. Thanks. Carol, thank you very much. Okay, well, before we go too far into this, I do want to let you know I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical or pharmacological researcher. I'm a conduit. So I do the research, and I've been working on this program for many, many years, using the Lloyd Library as a, an incredible resource. But the idea is to bring that information to you, to remind you that many of the uh, pharmaceuticals and medicines that you still use today started and may still be botanically oriented. So very common things are still in use today and have been for many hundreds of years. Some of the information is based on oral history, some from um, most current research. So when I do this program, if there's been too long of a span, I go out and I read the medical research papers. Yes, I'm a nerd. I go out and I read those very technical papers to see what has changed since the last time I did this program. And with that in mind, let's just think about this. Across what is now Ohio, from forest and prairies to lakeshore and riverbanks, plants were collected and utilized long before the Europeans and other people came to this country. 
the native people that were living here passed down that information to each other generation to generation through their oral histories. When the newcomers came, they brought plants with them. They might have been seeds, they might have been starts. However they got them here, they might have been in a tincture or a medicine or a powder, and they used them in their new home in this country. Now occasionally they ran into the situation where they couldn't get that plant to grow. So they would go out and try and find something similar. And once in a while, they had the privilege of getting information shared with them from the native people who were living here. And I think that's really important because what we read in our history books is all a whole lot of conflict. And it wasn't always that way. There was sharing of information. All right. So let's get this, let's get this going. All right, you all know folklore about different types of plants and how they were used medicinally. And as these methods of testing, more science is better in some cases, but they can actually tease the compounds out so they can find what's in that wild plant and match it to, for instance, there's research utilizing specific compounds to stop blood, cell, uh, blood flow to cancer cells. So that's just one example. But the idea that we go way back in time and a tincture or a powder was used that came from a plant we moved up a few hundred years, and then we move into that kind of the snake oil salesman. You don't know what's in that bottle. I kind of feel that way when I go in the natural section of the grocery store. What's in that bottle? And so all of a sudden, those natural medicines, all of those plant-based medicines, kind of fell into that realm of quackery, and they were you know, discounted. But the people who continued to use them and had been for all their centuries, their mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers or grandfathers, kept that alive because it, it was important and things had really an effect on um, disease and ill health. But here we are again. We're reassessing this, we're rethinking, rediscovering the naturally occurring botanical <coughs> compounds and the use in the medicine. And I put this uh, picture up here because can you imagine studying at home to get your pharmacist degree? You've never touched a single herb. You've never touched a single compound. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it's not that way anymore. And then that always brings me to the what if question. So what if a person with the mind of a scientist and the heart of a healer said, what if? And what if that plant has real medicinal qualities? What if there really is a compound in that plant can, that can affect a cure? And then here's the kicker. And what if we ignored that? We want to keep going on that possibility. So let's start with something simple. Supposedly everybody knows that willow and aspirin, the derivative from willow is what became aspirin, but there's a lot more to that story. In fact, willow gets all of the limelight. It was a different plant, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In a minute. So up there you see the word salicin. Salicin is a compound from willow. Here's a Here's a native, this is native black willow, grows every little wet spot across Ohio. And salicin in plants, and many plants that you already are growing or eating, have salicin. Salicin is the plant's way of protecting itself. In humans, you might think about the white blood cells when there's an infection or an inflammation. When a plant that has salicin in it is chewed on, has a disease, is cut, the salicin converts to salicylic acid, and becomes a very bitter taste, and so the creature that's eating it, hopefully the deer, may not want to continue to eat it. It's also like pulling the fire alarm. So now you've put that out as a very bitter tasting compound, and the insect or herbivore will not eat it anymore, but it also sends this growth hormone so that as soon as the herbivore goes away, it's already getting the message through those chemicals to start growing more of the plant. And I'm sure you've seen many plants that have been nipped by rabbits or so, deer, whatever, and they start coming again. You might do that yourself when you pinch back a perennial. We were just talking about that. You pinch it back and the plant goes, wait a minute, and instead of sending up one stalk, it might send out five. So let's talk about queen of the prairie and queen of the meadow. Queen of the prairie is native to Ohio and native to North America. Queen of the meadow, native to Europe. 
They are almost identical chem uh, chemical compounds. They were also called spirea in their former life. Taxonomists like to change names around a lot. So here you have Philopendula almeria, and then you have Philopendula rubra, the pink one. And what's interesting is queen of the meadow was being used by Bayer, which was not a pharmaceutical company when it started out. It was a dye manufacturer. So the colors for fiber, the colors for cloth. And using queen of the meadow to create a black dye, you had all this leftover cast off plant material. So the Bayer company says, all right, you're a chemist. What can you do with this? What can you find? What can you tease out of that? And how can we use it? So salicylic acid was originally identified from Queen of the Prairie or Queen of the Meadow in Europe. And now we have it here. It doesn't get the limelight like, like aspirin. In fact, the name aspirin comes from this plant. So A for acetyl salicylic, that's a mouthful. S-P-I-R for spirea, and I-N, according to Mr. Hoffman there, Dr. Hoffman, was a way to make it easy to pronounce. So aspirin became that term. It's not like that today. You look at those crazy drug names, nobody can say them. As I mentioned to you that salicylates also occur in other plants that you already know. You might have had some of these things for dinner. Broccoli, cauliflower, cucumber, Mushroom, radishes, zucchini, tomatoes, plums, watermelon, buckwheat. The list is very, very, very long. Now, the salicylic acid that comes out of there does affect pain relief, but it was very hard on the digestive system. So they worked to buffer that, and they acetylized it. That's why the name changed, so that it wasn't so hard on your stomach. This plant is really beautiful. It will get about five feet tall, and it has this plume at the top that is pink like cotton candy. Um, I have a book. Um, I'm a person who might try and eat plants. I'm not telling you to go out and do that. But I was following this. Uh, it's Lois Hole's uh, Edible Flowers. And I was kind of going through this book trying to decide what I might try, and I happened to have um, a source for some of those flowers. And it said to make fritters. Well, what's a fritter? You take the fresh leaf or the fresh flour, you dip it in sweetened butter, and you deep fry it. I could deep fry my shoe. It probably tastes pretty good. <laughs> Little powdered sugar. It's extremely bitter. If you've ever had aspirin, there's some of us in this group that might have been old enough to remember having aspirin dissolve in your mouth. It's extremely bitter. And so is that plant, because that's the plant telling you stop eating me. It worked, too. <laughs> so there is one of these little plants on the table tonight for uh, a gift. So let's go back to willow. They're about, uh, you know, for more than 4,000 years, this plant has been used. And even though people of those earlier time periods couldn't tell you exactly why it worked, they knew that it worked. So they might be collecting the leaves or the twigs. They could be making a tea from the leaves or the twigs or the roots or the bark. Um, and then they would use it for relieving pain, reducing inflammation, taking down a fever. Like I said, they couldn't tell you the exact method of how it works, but they knew that it worked. And somewhere along the line, when science caught up, they could finally go in and say exactly how that chemistry would work. Aspirin is identified as one of the most essential medicines on the planet. And with willow, I think here in Ohio, there's about 17 different varieties of willow, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So you might have a weeping willow in your yard. That one's not native. But things like black willow, pussy willow, there's quite a, a number of them. This one, you go anywhere where there's a little wet spot, you're probably going to find black willow coming in. So any kind of willow? Yes. Any of the willows have salicin that has been used by other people. Mm -hmm. Isn't salicin too much of that will cause your acid to go up, go up high? What was that? Isn't too much of the salicin will cause the body to produce too much of your acid to cause the joint stiffness? That, possibly. 
Yeah, you can, I mean, you can overdose on many different things. It can certainly cause some GI issues. Um, if you read the side effects, you know, if you've had too much, you start getting ringing in the ears, and it was the same thing. If you look in any of the old journals, that was one of the ways they would tell their patients to back off. But in terms of the other one, that I'd have to do a little more research in. Well, let's talk about pokeweed. This one, this is a plant that everybody loves to hate. Some people think it is the neatest plant. It's been around such a long time. It makes these lovely purple berries. The birds love them, which is okay as long as you're not hanging out laundry. You may have grown up in a neighborhood or in a place where they would go out in the spring when the shoots were coming up and collecting it and eating it. I do not advise this. This plant, according to the US FDA, all parts are considered toxic. They're poisonous. Don't eat it. And even if you're with somebody who has been eating it for years, I would still say, hmm, I don't think so. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. There are research. Uh, studies going on right now to look at the way it can be used against viruses and some fungal uh, infections under laboratory conditions. So you can see it's being used against things like herpes simplex, influenza, and the polio virus. That's in the lab. That's not you chewing on a stem or something like that. The thing about this particular plant, it has saponins, which can cause hemolysis of red blood cells. So when your blood cells are breaking down, that's a problem, definitely. There's a glucoside, which is going to affect the rhythm of your heart. You don't want to play around with that kind of thing. Now, the other situations with this particular plant is in almost every wild edible book, they're going to list this. They're going to tell you about, oh, you can eat the shoots. You can eat the berries, but you can't eat the seeds. About 10 seeds would send an adult to the hospital. If your child ate a few seeds, they would be in the emergency room getting their stomach pumped. A number of years ago, this is, this is actually an old study that uh, was written up in a medical um, journal. Many years ago, in a New Jersey nature camp, an overnight camp, they were having you know, basically a foraging uh, program. And they got the campers, and they went out and they collected the um, Poke weed, there's the berries in the plant if you don't know what it looks like. They followed the directions in their book about how to collect it and how you would be washing it, boiling it, throwing out the water, boiling it again, and so on. They fed it to all the campers and the counselors. There were about 52 people who got sick. A few of them ended up in the hospital requiring fluids. Some of them were still in the hospital about three days later. My comment about this is, why take the chance? If you have to boil something and throw the water away two or three times, I could have had dinner by then. <laughs> There's so many more other yummy things out there that you could eat. Why take a chance on something like pokeweed? I think it's beautiful. It's great for uh, pollinators. It's great for wildlife. But it's not something that I would be experimenting with. Do you know Jango gyms very early spring? I would not be surprised. <laughs> OK, let's talk about something nice. How about wild geranium? You can't be mad at that one. So here's the wild geranium. And this one has been in use for so many years. I mean, this is in the 1887 edition of the Madeira Medica. I have another one. This one is from 1919. Obviously, it's a reprint, paperback. But the idea that you could take the root of the wild geranium and make a tea or a decoction and then you could rinse the mouth to clean the gums. You could use it um, on the mouth of a baby. They get thrush, which is a fungal infection, a candida that forms that little white patch, often right after they've been born. It was also put onto the navel when the baby was born, just to keep uh, that site a little cleaner and hopefully put off an infection. It does have astringent properties, so it's going to dry things out. It might have been used if you had something like poison ivy. We only have poison ivy and poison sumac in the eastern edge. No poison oak in Ohio, just so you know. And what how, a beauty it is within your garden. So there's that pinkish purple. It if blooms at about knee high. This one is definitely showing promises as um, it's antibacterial. It's uh, showing inhibitory effects on things like E. coli, which we all have in our body. But it's OK in here. If it reaches out someplace else, that's a problem. 
that infection. Pseudomonas, um, Staphylococcus, Microsporum, which is a uh, fungal infection, and Trictophyton, which is ringworm, which is actually a fungal infection, not a worm, in case you didn't know that. So here's a very simple one. And what I like about this plant is that the, um, there's so many different ways it can be used. In fact, the essential oil taken from this plant is being looked at as a natural insecticide for larvae. So when we get into this time of the year and mosquitoes are so bad, something like the oil from this wild geranium will kill the wigglers without damaging the water and without killing other fish or whatever might happen to be in the water. Here are some other ways it's been used. If you're using any of the products such as Mrs. Meyer's Clean Day, wild geranium is in that. And again, it has that antibacterial properties. And you know, your bonus points, it's supposed to be to help you get more hair in this volumizing shampoo. And then there's where I was saying before where the essential oil is being looked at as a larvicide to be used in water. And it's still safe for other um, plants and animals in there. Sweet gum, this is another plant that I hear a lot of complaints about. Giant tree, leaves that have that look like five fingers or star-shaped, beautiful colors in the fall. But the complaints that I hear are all these gumballs that drop on the ground. People just hate them. You hate to walk on them. They're hard to you know, mow around. And this plant has been used in many of different ways. But the big news is flu. So if you've ever used Tamiflu, if you go back, oh, I don't know, 10 plus years when there was a big um, bird flu and a swine flu outbreak, Tamiflu was really hard to come by. And it's the unripened seeds in the sweet gum. So within that ball you're seeing with all little spikes are tiny seeds. The green unripened seeds contain shikimic acid. And that's a precursor to the product that then becomes what we know as Tamiflu. The other thing that they also found, they test all these different plants to see what other plants have the same compound. Star anise, if you've ever used that in cooking, star anise also had the same um, shikimic acid. And so those two things at first were being used until they could figure out how to synthesize it. When this first came on the market, it was hard to come by. But now they figured out what the chemical compound is. They know the chemical cocktail to put that together in the lab, and they don't have to be dependent on green sweet gum seeds or lots of star anise. This also is showing um, some antimicrobial effects. It's considered anti-inflammatory. It contains salicin. You're going to hear that word pop up a lot, I think, tonight. Spice bush, this is an excellent native shrub that you can have in the yard if you're looking for something to replace the honeysuckle. Everybody, we're, we're trying to get you to you know, get rid of that honeysuckle. You have to be a little more patient because the native plants may not grow as quickly. You know, Honeysuckle is like in two years, it's eaten your whole backyard, where something like spice bush is going to take a few more years. That's one I don't mind. <laughs> so this one was, they went and they collected um, the leaves to create um, a tea to help reduce fever, reduce gas, um, and ease colic. So if you've ever been around a colicky baby that cries and cries and you feel so helpless because you don't know what to do, that might have been one of those things. You put a few drops into that baby's mouth to break up the bubbles probably from that baby being allergic to um, milk or whatever the case might be, to break that colic cycle. The fresh crushed leaves, which have a really wonderful aromatic, slightly citrus smell, are used to repel insects. And can you imagine with these botanicals, that you might walk into an apothecary shop and say, you know what, I need about a half a pound of spice bush berries. Do you have any dried spice bush leaves? It doesn't work that way anymore. The spice bush berries are edible, but don't eat them raw. They're so strong and so bitter. Once they're dried, they were used as a substitute for all spice. All spice 
comes from a tree in tropical um, areas. Allspice is one little berry. It's not the combination of spices. Most people get confused about that. It's not cinnamon and cardamom and nutmeg. Allspice is one tiny berry from the allspice tree. And it does not grow in this area. It doesn't even grow in this country anywhere. It's in one little spot in the tropics. This was the North American answer to not having allspice by using the spice bush berries, allowing them to dry, grinding them, or dropping them into a pot of soup or stew to add that flavor, especially at a time before refrigeration where the meat that we're using might have been a little iffy, but you might have served it anyway, so you flavored it with lots of different spices. That would have been something to use. Thank you. So can you eat the, like the, can you eat the berries? The, they are so strong in your mouth, they're very aromatic, and you're not going to like that taste. They're completely a different flavor when they're dry. Okay, but what's the biggest advantage to having this bush? For the spice bush swallowtail butterfly, more spice bushes, more spice bush swallowtail butterflies. Yeah, right. Right. They have looked at this particular plant as a replacement for black tea using the leaves, and I think it's an acquired taste. My concern is when somebody talks about replacing, we, we grow black tea in a way, actually white tea and green tea, it's all the same plant. It's not native to this country. But when you start talking about replacing black tea with spice bush, does that mean that we're going to strip it out of the native woods? So we don't want that to happen. And then if you grow it commercially, it really kind of changes the whole dynamics of that plant. It would be a, um, you know, at that, at that point it becomes a crop if you're growing it that way. <laughs> um, it tastes a little bit like allspice. So if you think about the flavors of cinnamon, cardamom, nutmeg, ginger, it's a little bit like that. Once they're dried and you grind them, you can grind them in the coffee grinder, but, but if that's the only coffee grinder in the house and whoever else comes after you wants to make coffee, they're not going to be happy. Yeah. So you want to make sure that your grinder is just for, for that particular thing. The oil of the raw berries is used as a way, it's called imbrication, and that was used where they would crush those berries and rub it onto a joint. Think about something like Icy Hot or Bengay. And the compound that's in that raw berry, it tricks your body into thinking that it's hot. And I was telling her that you took the temperature of where we rub that, whether it was Bengay or Icy Hot or, or Absorbing Junior or Spice Bush berries. There's no change in the actual temperature, but that's putting out a little chemical into the bloodstream and into the nerves that are telling them it's warm, it's okay, calm down. And so that's when the pain relief starts to come through. I love this even more now. <laughs> We're going to win you over. Would you think of Ohio as a place to have pitcher plants? We're talking about a carnivorous plant. Yes. We do have native pitcher plants in the state of Ohio, so the purple pitcher plant. Um, the picture that's up there was our bog a number of years ago when they were growing lovely and they bloomed, and then we had to start all over <laughs> because the lining failed. We did get one bloom on some that my husband's been growing now. They're in their fourth year, so what you have are some very lovingly tended purple pitcher plants. We, as I said, we had one in another uh, container bloom. But this particular plant is reminiscent of bog, and so we're going back into glacial time. When you go into northern Ohio and there's kettle bogs, so it's where a gigantic boulder from the glacier ended up melting, 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 and you have this water that stands in there. It's much more acidic, and certainly we don't live in an acid soil area. So you have to create that bog, and that's, this is in peat. You're not going to be able to plant this out in your regular garden. But this particular plant has been used um, when the Native Americans were suffering from smallpox, something unfortunately brought over from Europe. They were trying so many different things, and um, a tea made from the dry leaf, which is this kind of this vessel-shaped or pitcher, 
to try and ease that. And it, it might have made them feel good a lot like, you know, if you drink a hot toddy, it might make you feel a little better, but it's not really affecting the root cause of why you're ill. And so they did, they have done research and there's really no evidence in terms of the compounds that are in the pitcher plant to affect smallpox. It was also used for pulmonary complaints and I think that goes back again to when you have a hot beverage, it's warm, you have that vapor going into you, you might get a little bit of relief from when you're having that. The rootstock has been used as a diuretic, so it's making you shed that extra water. If your heart's not working well enough and you have that fluid build up in your body, that diuretic will help shed that out of your system. I have a question. Is this whole pitcher plant or just purple pitcher plant? I'm just talking about purple pitcher plant. The research, the, the plants that I have and the ones that are on the screen are the ones that I was researching. What's really interesting is that a compound that has been derived from this purple pitcher plant and approved by the FDA and the American Veterinary Society is used in an injection in a trigger point. So if you think about you've had a sciatica or a bad uh, hip and nerve point where those come together, this is available as an injectable that is not a steroid. I think that's pretty important because you can only use steroids for a little while. But the idea that you might be able to have some relief is, you know, I'd be looking at that. I'd be asking more questions about that. Northern white cedar, not a cedar. <laughs> um, this is an arborvitae. Um, and this is a native evergreen here in Ohio. It has kind of a flat needle. And I bet you have encountered this plant and did not know it. If you've ever used something like Absorbing Junior or wart control, there you go. And the bottle at the top of the page, the Lloyd brothers had their own pharmacy. It was a compounding pharmacy and they went out and they collected or they had people go out and collect the botanicals that they then processed to get the very specific compound. And you could get a prescription or, or go and talk to them. And that was a time where you could get these things off the shelf. So Thuja, that's the genus name for this arborvitae. And the idea that this was being used as a way to reduce inflammation or clean a wound. It was also used, you might, I'm, a, I'm an animal person, so the word proud flesh is what I learned. On horses, it's when you might have a, a gash. And instead of that granulating in completely, the body gets mixed up and it sends out all this really vascular tissue and it bleeds so easily. It does happen in humans, they don't call it proud flesh. But this was a way to reduce that, to get that vascular and tissue to relax. And so that had been in use. It's in a wart control product. Now that product also contains pokeweed, so I'd be asking some questions. You're not taking it internally. And I also would caution you to go out when you're, when you're using these things, do your homework. Don't just buy it off the shelf. Don't just believe what you read on the internet. Do your homework and find out if that really has some medical background uh, behind it. In the case of that absorbing junior, again, it's tricking that sore um, joint. You've put that um, oil in there. You're tricking that joint, or you're tricking the nerves into calming down. They release all of this kind of, they call it the, uh, the P, which is a strong pain response. It releases that, it feels warm, and then it starts to cool down. You get a little bit of relief. We haven't changed the temperature on that joint. It may look a little red because it's actually stimulating blood flow to that spot. Who would think that Ohio has a cactus? And in our backyard, we have pitcher plants in the bog, and then we have cactus in a dry spot. And people look at that and shake their head. But yes, we do have cactus in Ohio. Just one, just one. Not like if you're out in New, uh, New Mexico where they have, I think, 11 or 14 species of this Opuntia. So here's this pretty little prickly pear. And when you come up to look at it, I will caution you, do not touch it. <laughs> Because even though you might see the big spines, it's the little hairy ones that get you every time. Trying to keep the neighbor's cat out of the garden, you could plant some of this. 
All parts of this have been used for both food and medicine. If you go out for some, uh, some Latin food, some Mexican food, and you see nopales on the menu, it's prickly pear. If you're up at Jungle Gyms and you see the nopales, the pads that are there, it's prickly pear. Now they have scraped them and put them through the fire to get rid of all of those prickles. And you're eating that, you're getting the, um, that first skin off and you're eating that inner portion. It has the consistency of uh, an artichoke heart, a little bit of lemony flavor, they're quite tasty. This also makes a lovely little fruit. In the case of this particular plant, the fruit is about this big. So we're not gonna be getting a whole lot of um, cactus pear margaritas because there's just not enough. The idea that the leaf pad is in clinical testing to reduce the plaque, so in, in terms of if you think about the way a statin would work to reduce that plaque that's in the vessels. The raw fruit has high vitamin C and lots of antioxidants. Um, and so that was always my question. Do you think it has the same effect on blood sugar or reducing cholesterol if you're drinking it in an adult beverage? I don't know. But I might be willing to try. Just think, though, if you go out and you buy it in this concentrated form, fruit has a lot of sugar. So you have to be aware of that if you, you have a situation where you need to watch the amount of sugar you're consuming. That's going to have a lot of sugar in it. Those flowers are about that big, about the size of a billiard ball, beautiful, sunny, butter yellow. You might get about 24 hours when they're blooming, but they're really gorgeous. And they're actually pretty easy to, to grow around here. A little harder to get out if they end up in the wrong bed. It does have a little bit of mucilaginous goo. If you break that pad off, it's a little slimy, but that has been used as a protectant. So if you had, um, it was used in the case where you might have a rash or a bug bite, just like you might put a little aloe, that was also used. Not the, not the nicest term if you're thinking about eating something, mucilaginous. And what about milkweeds? Again, can you imagine going into the apothecaries and say, I need three milkweed pods. I need the root of this Asclepius tuberosa. It just seems a little odd to me. But maybe that's the better way to go. At least you know exactly what you have in your hand. It hasn't been adulterated. Pleurisy root, and I want to tell you that pleurisy was the name for pneumonia. Pleurisy today is an inflammation of the sac of your lungs. That's different. Pleurisy in that time was pneumonia. And that's the other trick. When you're doing this scientific research and you're going back in time, you have to learn a different language because some of the uh, ill effects or diseases had different names. And it might take you a little while to catch that up to understand that. These plants, again, all parts of all milkweeds are toxic. You should not be eating them. I'm telling you how they were used. I'm telling you now, do not eat them. And the idea that even though it's being used in some of these things, it contains cardiac glycosides. That should be flashing in bright red. If you are handling or taking something that affects the rhythm of your heart, that is a problem. So why take a chance? And there's lots of reading going on, in fact, about milkweeds of any kind. There's lots of places out there, especially when during COVID there were so many people out foraging and they were talking about eating this and that. Oh, you can get the raw milkweed pods and you boil them and throw the water away, a lot like pokeweed. And again, my point is, why? Why take that chance? There's so many other good things you could be eating. And why are you wasting those pods that could be more milkweed plants out in the wild? All of the milkweeds, all of them, contain those cardiac glycosides. And if that's going to disrupt the function of your heart, do not consume it. The other thing you need to know about is that if you're a gardener or a person who works in a yard and you end up working with a lot of milkweed and you're handling it, you can actually absorb some of that sap. And if you've ever broken milkweed, it's that very sticky, bitter sap. And that's the plant's way of saying, do not eat me. Now, obviously, the monarch doesn't care. And that's why they're red and black, because then it's saying to the world, do not eat me. But that milky sap can be on your hands. And then if you were to wipe your eye, it can cause your cornea to have a lot of swelling. 
And I try and get people to know that so that if you're out gardening and you have a situation and you go to the emergency room, tell them you were handling milkweed because most ERs have no idea. And all you can say is, well, I was out in the garden, I was weeding. And so they have this long list of plants and I can almost guarantee milkweed is not gonna come into that conversation. So just keep an eye on that. You're probably like me. You go out into the garden and you've got your gloves on. You think you're going to be good. You feel like you can't feel the plant. So here's a glove and there's a glove. And the next thing you know, you've handled everything. Why this affects humans that powerfully? But how come it does not affect rabbits and uh, deer? Because they've been eating my small milky, they're fudging nuts. Right. And that's a mystery we will never know. All of the other wild creatures can eat many things that you and I cannot. Squirrels, deer, they eat buckeyes, no problem. You and I eat that, we go to the hospital. We eat milkweed, we go to the hospital. The deer, no problem. I mean, the monarch eats it and contains that poison in its body so that nothing else will eat him. And then the viceroy mimics the monarch as if to say, I'm poisoned too, don't eat me. Now, how can that insect who can't really, I mean, there's not a logic there, but there is, we just don't know about it. We are a very sensitive creature. <laughs> I think that's what it comes down to, right? And the only one that can be looking out for you is you. And the more that you learn about some of these things, I'm not trying to scare anybody about these medicinals, I'm just telling you how they were used, how they might be used, the research that's being done, I'm not telling you to eat them or use them for yourself, mostly to do your homework and be aware. So let's go back to that what if question, right? Thankfully, many people of the world, all over the place, each of them with the mind of a scientist and the heart of a healer, continue to ask that what if question. And imagine the first person who brought a milkweed in and said, here, eat this. <laughs> or pokeweed, or whatever, fill in the blank, dandelion roots, spinach, Whatever it is you might be eating, somebody had to try it first. And the first person who said, you know, when I ate that, my fever went down. And when they told it to the next person, they might have gone, yeah, I don't know about that. But the idea is that they kept asking that question. And as science has caught up where we can verify that, we now know how those chemicals work in the body and they can either change the course of the infection or reduce that fever or ease pain because we can see the pathways of how that chemical works in the body. They seek out those medicinal qualities. They quantify them with science. It's not just something you read on the internet. They quantify these with science and that's what I'm encouraging you to do. The Lloyd Library here in Cincinnati, we are so lucky to have this resource here in Cincinnati. And every day I meet people that have never heard of it and never been there. How many here have been to the Lloyd Library? Oh, yay! That's wonderful. The Lloyd Library was a private library museum started by the three Lloyd brothers. Curtis would travel the world and collect books and plants and bring them back. John was the pharmacist and had either was collecting or sending people out to collect the plants. And then Nelson was kind of the business guy. But they kept incredible notes. And when Curtis brought back um, information, research, there are text from the 1500s in this library. Now, you can't walk in and say, I want to see that book from 1425. But you can make a request, and they might bring it down from the reading room. You can also do research at home using the Lloyd because so many of these books have now been digitized. So if you have that question about what's that compound in milkweed at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're in your bunny slippers, you can look it up. They have excellent programs on a regular basis. You just have to, to look that up. Tomorrow night there's one on toxic honey. Think about that. If an insect is consuming the nectar from a plant that is poisonous, is the Honey going to be poisonous. Excellent. Um, that's the group of folks that I was working with when I did that uh, exhibit up at the governor's mansion. Hope Taft asked ask me to be involved in that. If Hope Taft asks you to do something, you do it. She's wonderful. Absolutely. Gardener, non, just 
Nobody else can beat her out. She's down there in the dirt. She knows how to grow things. Incredible. If you have a chance to go up to the uh, governor's mansion, you can just make a reservation and go up. They do tours on certain days. When Hope Taft was there, she brought in soil and boulders and areas to create all of the different um, eco or, um, ecological areas of the state of Ohio. So you can find things like the prickly pear, you can find the pitcher plant, the lakeside daisy. She brought a boulder back from Adams County that's about the size of a VW bug because she wanted to create the walking fern and some of the other habitats that are found in Adams County on this dolomite that doesn't exist anywhere else. Okay, your head is spinning. I'm sure you have lots of questions. So, shall we just take questions that way? All right. Who has a question? No, your head's spinning. I can't believe it. You had a picture of that flower, the... Uh... Royal catch fly? Yeah, what, what, what medicinal purpose does that have? That's a very good question. I'll have to give you the book and we can look it up together. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Foss, I know, I did. <laughs> I love red, red plants, so that one was really beautiful. But I'm sure every, every plant on the planet has medicinal properties. It has a use. We just may not be smart enough to find it out. And we have to balance when we do find it out that we just don't rip it all out of the, the native place that it's growing, because that would be the worst thing, is to completely decimate that habitat or get rid of that plant within that habitat. You know that happened with vanilla. When the French decided to take vanilla, the orchid, from South America back to France, it bloomed. It never got pollinated because there's one little tiny specialist bee that didn't exist outside of this area in South America. So those vanilla orchids had to be hand pollinated, and a lot of them are hand pollinated for vanilla production. So when you go and pay $15 for a few vanilla beans, you understand why. Yeah, right. Uh, so it seems like it would be very hard to find the books that tell you how to do this stuff because like growing up, I never, I never knew that you could eat a plant outside of Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> so like, how did you kind of figure out how to, because this is right. some like different stuff. This is some really, right. Well, um, I will say my first gardening and eating plant experience was with my little Italian grandmother, my nanny. She lived in Coryville. She had a terraced garden. And my job at about this high was collecting some dandelion grains. And so the idea that, OK, we all picked dandelions and brought them back to our mother. But my nanny was sending me out for the greens. And you got to know the very wonderful, you know, weird kind of pointed shape. You don't get them when they're too big because they'll be too bitter and they would become part of the salad or they might get put in a little pan with a little bacon grease or a little olive oil. And so that, I think that was some of that early experience. And then I had a very patient mother because I was always asking many, many questions. And I tried a lot of plants when I was a kid. I'm amazed I'm here today <laughs> when I think about it. Um, but I, I think that was just one of those, because I was so interested, she just kept making these opportunities available to me. And I think that's a big thing. If you find a person who's interested in that, I mean, all you got to do is go back a little bit in time. I mean, look at, look at all the books that Yule Gibbons put together, you know, Stalking the Wild Asparagus. That was kind of the Bible on eating wild plants for the longest time. And so when you have some of that, and you go and you start to see some of these names that just keep coming over and over again, the books that I have up here, like this Madeira Medica, that's a completely different way of looking at it. It's not eating them, it's how they were used medicinally. And most of that started in Europe, where they were cataloging plants and trying to stretch out those compounds. And now it just keeps expanding. There's even a physician's desk reference, so PDR, which almost any doctor's office used to have. There's one just now for herbal medicines. Yeah. But yeah, there's lots of resources. You just got to make sure you, you're on the right path. Yeah. Any other questions? Where 
On, on herbal medicines? Yeah. yeah, there are some. I have, I have one that is, um, it's probably about this wide, about this big, and it's the ethnobotany of Native Americans. And the paper is so thin, it's almost like um, the old phone book paper. And Daniel Mormon spent about 12 years researching that and putting it in a format where you could look up the tribe, you could look up the ailment, and you can look up the plant. And so all these things come together. Now it's all been digitized, so you can look at that up. But there are many, many encyclopedias out there. I don't know what that's that's for. What do they call that? A compendium? Yes, a compendium. Yeah, yeah there are many of them out there. Yeah. You go out and you them up and get the experience. Mm. I can't sanction that. <laughs> so a lot of the ones you've talked about are ones that people have used, but like don't recommend it today or it's not safe. Are there any like common native plants that like you could plant or that you find in your yard that you do feel like confident of like people using them as teas or like medicinally? Like a you know that gets a little that gets a little into the weeds, pun intended, because it's one of those things where I don't feel like I'm the expert to go out and say, here, use this. I mean I can tell you what I have tasted and, and what I have used. Yeah. Well, for instance, um, do you know what sourgrass is? It's a little oxalis. It kind of, think about, think about a shamrock, the shape of a shamrock. So this little plant called yellow sorrel, most people think it is very uh, weedy, and it has a very funny looking seed pod about that tall that looks like a pickle, and as a kid, we called them pickles. And it's a little bit sour tasting, not exactly like vinegar, a little more citrusy or a sour apple. And I mean, that's something that I've added into salads. Um, purslane, which most people, it's not native, but purslane, which is a cute little succulent, we are one of the only people that do not eat it on purpose. It's very tasty. It, it will grow in the crack of your sidewalk, but it will also grow very well in your garden bed. And now some of the farmer's markets are growing and selling it. It has a, a little tuberous stem. You can eat the leaves, the seeds, the flowers, and its chemistry changes, so it converts the sugar overnight, and it's a little more sour in the morning. It changes it to malic acid, and then if you collect it later in the day, it's converted back to glucose. It's a little sweeter. But you can eat it raw. You can saute it. Some people think it's a little slimy, like okra. I like okra, so it's OK. Um, and there's other things that I will use, and if I was out on a hike, I might grab and, you know, if I got a cut or something, but I don't feel like I'm the person to be your teacher. I can tell you these things, but if you want to study that, I think you really need to find somebody who's very dedicated and had lots of time, not just somebody taking a Sunday afternoon hike. Yeah. Like, hey, let's go eat this. I've like learned some about like mullen and hyssop, uh -huh. which we have in like mm -hmm. tinctures and stuff, so I'm just wondering. Mullen is another non-native. It has really soft leaves. I have one that's probably about eight, nine feet tall. The leaves were used in teas. It was also smoked. It was used in your shoe, if you had a hole in your shoe. It was used for when you went to the outhouse, because <laughs> there wasn't any paper. Um, it was used as baby diapers and other absorbent types of things. So it, it, there's a use for everything on the planet. Yeah, you just have to know what it is you're looking at. And what did you say that was? Mullen. 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 Do you know what um, lamb's ears looks like? Are you familiar with that? It's fuzzy. Mullen has leaves that are about this long and wider across than my hand. And then it shoots up a stalk in the second year at about seven, eight feet and has little yellow flowers. When that would dry, people would take that stem and dip it in tallow and then use it as a torch. Pre-flashlight days. Right, and there was lots of tallow back then. All right. If there aren't any more questions, we can go on to what y'all came for, you know, the door prizes. What I found interesting is that all this information is within, what, 100 years, 150 years, would you say, or maybe 200 years? I'd say at least 200, yeah. And, and these things are everywhere around us, and we've only scratched the surface. What is out there, and if 
we don't protect our environment and our ecosystem, we'll never know what we have to take advantage of. So th this is amazing. It was one of my favorite. I was looking forward to it the whole Good. time. So one more, one more round of applause for <laughs> Here, put that one back on the table. We have one more question, I think, and then we'll do the yard uh, door. Do you know of an app that will help us identify what we got going on in our yards? I get asked that question every time I do a plant program. I do not have any plant apps on my phone, but there are plenty of them out there, and it's one of those, um, uh, trying to think of the um, plant net is a big one. Picture this, of course, Google Lens, but you know, you're probably getting down into that 30, 40%, and if your picture's unclear, who knows what it's gonna tell you. Um, iNaturalist. iNaturalist works really well. You can take my card and send me a picture. <laughs> iNaturalist is free, and the, there's a web, uh, there's an app called Seek, S -E yes, Seek is managed by iNaturalist. Yes. So you just have to take a picture, and then you say, what is that? Now here's the other way. If you join a native plant class, uh, app, Facebook page, a native plant Facebook page, like uh, landscaping with Midwest native plants, and you put up a picture, and you put the wrong name, you'll have 10 right answers in about three seconds. <laughs> you will get schooled immediately. So if you can do that and just kind of take it with a grain of salt. But um, my husband and I both look through that in this landscaping with native plants. And we are, um, well, you're an administrator now. Yeah, and, and I'm an expert on there. But there are so many good people out there that will help you. So you can post a picture to that Facebook page. There's plenty of them out there. You can also take our card. We get, uh -huh. we get questions sent to us. Um, which is much better to have a photograph than in the old days I'd have things left on my front doorstep because I, I do a lot of wildlife things and I'd have things in boxes on my doorstep. So this is nicer. And what, what happens is I look at it, then I might talk to Mr. Mundy, and if we can't get it, we have a lot of botanist friends. And you are pretty good figuring these things out. Every day. Every day on Facebook, Nature Resort Photography, um, sometimes it's other wildlife as well where I'm out there if I get a picture of it. But I'm usually doing a lot of uh, plants uh, because I'm selling them so uh. But he tells you a little bit about the plant. It's really a little education. And if you're a photographer, he also posts what camera he used and, and the setting. But really it's about where, it was, where it's growing, um, something unique like that in the information. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you, Carol. That was great. I my want pleasure. Thank you for coming. And remember, I'm this serious. will be on my the Forest Park Environmental webpage under video collection. Just go to my homepage, go down to the video collection link, click on it, and you'll have all of her presentation. So far, six of them, I believe. I think so. And uh, enjoy them at home. Tell your friends about it. Thank okay, you. so thank you for coming.